It's that time of the day. Yep, it really is. The GB News pub is opened. And joining me on Talking Pints is Dominic Frisby. Dominic, welcome. Thank you very much to Nigel. Talking Cheers. Pints. Very good to see you. You too. Mm. First today, terrific. Am I allowed to identify what it is on air? No, no, okay. no, no, no. Not until they sponsor us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic. I did the voiceover for all their corporate videos just last, just last week. Oh, did you? Yeah. They're, they're a growing brand. They're a growing brand. Mysterious and, growing brand. And they come from the west of England. They come from Cornwall. Very west. And they were tiny not long ago. And actually, what's happened with beer, British beer, just shows you that when you free a market up, when you deregulate... I mean, I hadn't imagined the conversation would start like this, but here it is. Yeah. But, but actually, pubs were freed up in many ways to start to buy other guest beers, etc. And it's seen a massive growth in breweries everywhere, hasn't it? It's just fantastic. And I just remember moaning about how bad beer was in the 90s, all those bland lagers that tasted of absolutely yeah. nothing, and you had to sort of really dig around to find some sort of rare real ale that was nice and then if you started demanding some nice real ale you were br branded some oddball and then suddenly the, we had this craft beer revolution and yes, just phenomenal. so much delicious beer out there yeah and local breweries and so. that's the what's yeah, so great yeah, about it yeah. it's real localist movie yeah no it's fantastic well the voiceover you very much started in doing you know voiceovers and these kind of things and and you kind of graduated more and more into comedy yeah which you've now been doing for quite a long time, 25 years or so. Something like that, off and on, yeah. You know, and you do your songs, and, and, and uh, it was my great, um, great honour as a Brexiteer to have you on the stage in Parliament Square the moment we left the European Union. That was one of the most fantastic nights in my life, singing, sing, singing a theme tune that probably we can't say on air no, now. It's too and early. you were being interviewed on Sky News. Yes, I was. Well, all this invective yeah. was being Yes, I was live in the background. on Sky and Dominic's on the stage in the background <laughs> singing with some quite adult words. But what I, do, what I do enjoy is I think comedians need to laugh at themselves. I did see that as a voiceover man, you were once asked to compare... A football game for Fulham FC, but sacked after one outing. That was, uh, yeah, that was a long what time ago. What did you do? Well, I, I wasn't entirely to blame, but the, um, what had happened is Fulham, Fulham Football Club, were determined to make their ground, Craven Cottage, more intimidating for opposition fans to visit, which kind of sounds fair enough in principle until you consider that the, the Fulham is people, full of people called Charlie and Rue who have never intimidated anyone in their lives. <laughs> and uh, they wanted to get this somebody in to sort of G up the crowd, and they auditioned all these various people, and I... I um, uh, for the, for the pre-season friendlies. And the pre-season friendly that I got was Fulham against Glasgow Rangers. And there was the sight of 17,000 Glaswegians descending on sleepy Fulham with red hair and kilts and tooth decay was and it? all the rest of it, Go screaming on. these songs. And the Fulham fans, there's only about 2,000 of them, they dwarfed, they just dwarfed the Fulham fans. And I remember turning to all the Glaswegians and saying, come on, let's have a cheer for all the Rangers fans. And they were like, I'm near cheering that English. <laughs> <Not."> <laughs> so they just went totally quiet. And the powers of being at Fulham were like, this guy's great. He can get the opposition fans to shut up. So that I got the gig. And then this was the first game back. And I'll never forget, it was Fulham against Bolton when Sam Allardyce was the manager mm. of Bolton. And I was stood there in between the two dugouts. And Al Fayed... Um, was the chairman of yeah, Fulham. Yeah. And he had insisted on going on and doing this rap before the beginning of the game, buoyed up by the success he'd had on the Ali G show. And um, the DJ played the wrong backing track. So Al Fire was left standing there going, this is the wrong music, this is the wrong music. And, he, you know, they love him at Fulham, but he totally died on his backside. And anyone involved... With, with the PR team or the, the oh, DJ, all everyone got the sack. Right, so, what, <laughs> what, so that's why I lost Good the job. Good story, but <laughs> Dominic, you know, you've done some very, very funny stuff. You've done some very cutting stuff. I know your most recent, your most recent little video that's out there on YouTube um, talks about ugly people and how they're a very discriminated against group, but no one speaks up for them. And you're very much on the front line of the war on woke, the war against cancel culture. How difficult is it being a comedian now? Because what you simply can't say or words that are unacceptable. I mean, do you find yourself getting cancelled from events? Yeah, well, I, um, all the time. And comedy is as divided in the sort of the culture war as, as everywhere else is. Yeah, I bet it is. And so you go to some clubs and they're a bit more... You're able to say stuff and other clubs, you know, they just won't... You know, that 
the famous Brexit song that I did probably got me, lost me maybe half the life work that I once had because people who are on the other side of the Brexit argument were like, I'm not having him, my, him in my club. So that goes on. That's fine. But the, I'll give you an example of something that happened two weeks ago. Just a little new material night where near where I live in, in Broccoli in South East London. Mm. And it's essential in a new material night more than anywhere else that you have freedom of expression because you haven't yet found the right way of wording something yet. Mm -hmm. And so inevitably, you're going you're gonna to make mistakes. You're not going to get it absolutely right. And if you don't have freedom of expression there, yeah. then you've got it nowhere. So this is your sort of tester. Really. This is, you, yeah, comedians all go yeah. and do new material all the time. Yeah. You, you find that those really tight, perfect routines that you see people doing on the telly, you know, they've spent many, many hours, if not weeks, if not years, getting those routines tight. You know, new material nights. Anyway, so I was doing this new material night. I was doing that routine about how ugly people aren't properly represented, they're the most discriminated against group in the media and so on. And, and I did the line, it's not the greatest line in the world, but this was the line I did, which was that nobody's campaigning on behalf of ugly people, nobody's going around tearing down statue, statues of Adonis, crying out, ugly lives matter. Right, and that was, do and, and I think, it's not the funniest joke in the world, but I'm making a very important point about this group because it doesn't matter what race, what age, what sex... But what you're country. seeing whether this is funny. Or and, and I'm seeing whether it's funny. Yeah. And then somebody wrote into the club afterwards, I didn't feel safe. Uh, this man was making fun of Black Lives Matter. He okay. was uh, punching down and all this stuff, which I, I really wasn't in that routine. But it's got to the point now where people just hear the words. Mm. They don't even hear the argument anywhere. They just hear trigger words. And then the guy, the poor guy books the club. He just wants a quiet life where people can come to his club and try new material. And he makes, you know, whatever he makes, 50 quid a week or something. He's suddenly got a, like a mini storm on his hands. And, and that's just an example of what's going on. So... There'll be somebody in the audience, and I imagine this happened to you all the time oh, at the BBC. Oh, I've been through it all. Yeah. 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 And, you know, people are like, why, why are they giving Nigel Farage a platform? That's right. Yeah. And, and that same argument is going on at every level. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a Can form... Can we fight back and win this culture war? Well, at the level of comedy, we have to win it by being funnier than the other side. <laughs> and, you know, you, you won your battles in the culture war because you won the argument. Well, because there was a silent majority there. Yeah. And, and I think the silent majority felt they were being talked down to, they were being patronised, frankly being lied to. And mm. when they got the chance to speak... They spoke. On the 23rd of June. 17 million of them. 70.4 <laughs> million of them. Absolutely. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't get what Dominic's talking about, do YouTube. Uh, do, do, do Google, have a look at YouTube and you'll see the song. Provided you're over a certain, provided you're about fifteen or over, it's yeah. fine and it's totally acceptable. Uh, but it's meant to be funny, and it is actually very, very funny. But Dominic, you know, you've done all of that. You're a comedian. I love some of your stuff. It's very, very funny. Uh, you're good at it. You're fighting those other battles. What people don't know about you is there is a much more serious Dominic Frisbee, and we first met many, many years ago at a gold conference. At a gold conference. So, you know, you're very, very into. Uh, money, you've been writing articles for Newsweek, for all sorts of organisations. And you wrote a book, How Tax Shaped Our Past and Will Change Our Future. And I know you feel very strongly about tax, and you, you made the argument to me before that, you know, taxes, or the perception of unfair taxes, has caused many wars over the years. Oh, no. Uh, it, it's the, it, my theory is that tax has shaped the entire course of civilization. And every war in history was funded by some kind of tax, either, before, either during or after the event. You plunder and then you tax. Every revolution was a rising up against some kind of injustice perpetrated by the economic injustice perpetrated by the tax system. Every so it's conquest. Romans, it's, it's, it's the sheriff. Not, it's the sheriff of Nottingham. The sheriff, it's, it's, it's everything. Yeah. You know, the, the idea of the sense of duty to the greater collective, which is what taxes are, will have existed in the hunter-gatherer societies that predated civilization. And, you know, the famous quote, there's two inevitab inevitabilities, death and taxes. And who's, the guy who said that, by the way, it's attributed to Benjamin Franklin, mm. but it was actually a comedian. Was it? <laughs> it's a line from a farce in the early 18th century. <laughs> well, I'm pleased, so, to, I'm pleased to hear that. But you also, you write about cryptocurrency, you write about financial markets, you, and without, you know, breaking any 
Financial Conduct Authority rules. Give us your take on the investment world today. Well, it's very difficult because so much money is being printed. Like every day, the Bank of England's printing another 1.4, 1.5 billion, whatever it is. And the large majority of that money is making its way into financial assets. And so cash, you know, if you think in the, in the, in the 1800s, in the 19th century, things got cheaper over the course of the century. So stuff was one price at the beginning of the century. Mm -hmm. It was cheaper by the end of the century because we got better at making stuff and money held its value. Today we live in a world where everything is rising in price. Houses, um, even wages And are is that up. because there's more money chasing yeah. the same number of goods? It, precisely it's that. simple as that. It's as simple as that. And, you know, by holding cash, you are guaranteeing that that... And it's a war on... on people say it's a war on savers. It's a war on people who rely on salaries because their salaries are effectively losing 5 or 10% of their purchasing power every year. Ah, but Boris Johnson told us last week that wages are going up, so everything's fine. Hey, Boris Johnson is a big spender. As long as he's got money to spend, that's what he wants. That's all he cares about. And he'll get that money however it is, whether it's zero interest rates. So those that have been frugal and, and saved money and kept it in the bank, I mean, they're just... The world, does, the world rewards debtors. Once upon a time, <coughs> it rewarded savers. It doesn't now. All that sort of Dickensian, you know, logic of, of saving more than you spend. Yeah. Now get into as much debt as you possibly can, as cheaply as you possibly can, and buy assets. That's, the, that's been the trade. And if inflation goes up... Then we're in the big so trouble. Uh, but, is, but it is going up. Yeah. Is it going to go on going up? It's, it's, of course it is. <laughs> Every, it's, it's, we're, you know, the Bank of England can raise rates, or central banks uh, around the world can raise rates, and immediately they, the, the whole bubble goes... Pss, mm. So they've got to keep the bubble going. They can't afford to raise oh. rates. They're damned if they do and damned if they don't. It's a really, it a really mess. tricky no, no, situation. I, mean, I, I, I get that. Absolutely, mm. it's a mess. Dominic, we're out of lockdown. Uh, the Thursday nights in London, I mean, you can't move. The bars are overflowing and people are back in the theatre and there's a little bit more happiness about the place. Yeah. There. Yeah, I mean, the tubes are crowded, the tube coming over. It wasn't packed, but it was, you know, and it's, it, see, it feels like life has gone back to normal. Yeah. Nobody's, like, occasionally there's all this sort of, do you shake hands with somebody, do you touch yeah. fists, do you do the elbows, a bit of that. But life, yeah, it does feel like life is going back to normal. Thank goodness. Yeah, no, it's been a long, long time. And are we going to start becoming happier again? I hope so. We need friendship, we need social contact if we're going to be happy. I don't think... There are some people who enjoyed the lockdown, yeah. but ultimately the most depressed people are the people... You, you need contact with other people. Do you know, I was reading a piece in the papers today about the city, about the London Metal Exchange, where I work. Yeah. And they talked about the new culture that's come in, you know, and they said, of course, some don't agree, Nigel Farage, you know, belongs to the old culture. And I read the article and I thought, yeah. Do you know what? We used to laugh. C the camaraderie. Fun. The camaraderie. Yes. yes. In the city, you know, all yeah. those traders. But, but all through life, yeah. people would take the mickey, would have fun, perhaps say things to each other that the other person didn't find offensive and were said in jest, and these things are all banned and all... You've got to... That's the other thing. The, 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 the argument in this cancel culture is, A, straw-manning people, but, B, quoting people out of context. Mm. And you're like, no, I didn't mean that. I was saying that to him in this circumstance when the moral guidelines were this and the line was there. You're quoting me as though I'm saying this and this when the line's here. I'm sorry, yeah. but that quoting people out of context, which is possible because everything is recorded, yeah. it's a damaging... It's a, it's a fighting tool. But, but you're going to go on fighting the good fight. I, I will. I, can I plug a show I'm doing? Am I allowed to do that? Is he allowed to do that, producer? Yeah, of course he is. So, oh, November the 8th. I couldn't stop you anyway, it's live. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got a pause well, I'm button. I'm trying to be polite. We haven't got a pause Nigel. button. I'm trying to be polite. Go on. Go, November go the 8th, um, uh, Comedy Unleashed at the Backyard in Bethnal Green. Comedy Unleashed, great comedy club. November the 8th, I'm doing... Uh, a, sh a show with a huge band called Before I'm Deleted. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it's a night of great songs. And well, we're there. it's a I, great jazz band we got. Before I'm Deleted. <laughs> he never stops this bloke. Dominic, thank you. That